Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Carver and I, Niels Castle larsen where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. Rob, wonderful to be back with you this week. Hope you had a good start to the new year. How are things in the uh, in the UK? Uh, UK is, uh, is cold, uh, which I guess is probably a good thing, actually, given that, you know, last year was the hottest ever on record. So, um any, any hint that the temperatures aren't going to skyrocket is probably a good thing, but um, that's good. A um, lot of political uncertainty at the moment. We don't know whether we're going to have our election in May or perhaps at the same time as the US election, which can make things interesting. Um, so political situation is very, very uncertain, very variable at the moment. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't feel like um, the year started with kind of any any big news so far. It's, it's just early days and I, I guess people are still dragging themselves back to their desks and deciding what what positions they should have on and uh you know from a market's perspective it's still fairly quiet yeah and no, I, I, I agree with that although you and i have some big news to talk about later on in the show that just came out yesterday i guess um but overall i completely agree with your uh sentiment and um yeah just uh before we dive into um our topics and actually quite a lot of questions which we appreciate so thanks very much for sending uh those in um, you know, I often, I, I, I try to ask you, besides the topics we're going to be talking about, um, besides the initial sort of how are, we, how are you doing, I do like to think about the, uh, or le hear about what, what's been on your radar. If there's anything that since we last spoke, which was in mid-December when we did the group uh, recording, if just there's anything that's you sort of picked up on your, your radar thinking, well, you know, this could be interesting. This sh I should keep an eye on that uh, in the next uh, few months or maybe 2024 uh, as, as a whole. Yeah, I, I mean, so one thing I, I, I don't like doing actually is is talking about kind of short periods of time. So, for example, I'm not going to tell you, you know, my year-to-date performance because I think it's a bit absurd. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you know, I can count, almost count on one hand the number of trading days has been since the beginning of the year that actually you know, where markets have been open. So that, that does seem a bit silly. Um, having said that, though, there are there is some early indications that, that you know, where there is action in the markets, it's it's generally in, in commodities. So, you know, I do have this little table I put up and uh, tells me which markets have been most active and based on, as I said, a very small sample, um, you know, ga gas markets um, have been going up quite a bit recently, um, which is, and I don't know whether that's sort of normal seasonal behavior or whether that's kind of, you know, whether that is actually interesting potentially, um, because I guess, you know, everyone feels like um, last year we, we successfully kind of came through this period of high inflation and the central banks were amazing and they've done this brilliant job and soft landing and now we're going to have a really gentle decrease in interest rates and a kind of return to the Goldilocks economy that we all know and love. Um, so, you know, that that's that's one story that, that may turn out that way. Um, but you know, there are the list of things that can go wrong with that scenario are, you know, extraordinary. So I actually made a discretionary call on, on, on interest rates peaking and I was about three or four days off last year. So, you know, that's my, I think my, I'm, I normally do about one good discretionary call every decade in the last 10 years I've done two. So, you know, I, I've, my, uh, my CV for a job as a discretionary macro trader, I'm sure is going to be approved any day now. Um, but you know that, and it obviously interest rates have come down a fair bit. Um, but, um, you know, not, not the actual fed funds rate, but the kind of five and 10 and 20 year rates have come down, uh, particularly actually interestingly in the UK. Um, but the, you know, there are so many things that can go wrong with that. And the obvious one of course is a, a return of inflationary pressures as well as, you know, the kind of macro risk around war and, and stuff like that. So although I pre prefaced, prefaced my remarks at the beginning of the conversation with, you know, well, not much has happened yet. The potential for stuff to happen is really there and 
you know, one one thing that, that people have noted is, you know, if you look at the level of the VIX, it's really low. Um, you know, given that there is so much uncertainty out there, it's really not reflected in the markets, um, the volatility at least. And whether that's because of, you know, sort of asymmetric pressures of, of people selling vol through structured products or these one day options, you know, that's that mainly conjecture. But but you know, if you if you believe that the, the VIX is a fair price of volatility, at the moment it looks really, really cheap. It doesn't match the headlines because the head the headlines sort of scream, oh my God, you know, you know, there's two two kind of big wars going on if at the moment effectively and all these inflationary pressures could return and, you know, who knows what can happen. Yeah, I mean, as I as I listen to you saying that, uh, a, a few things come to mind. One is, of course, that we always think the volatility will come show up in the equity space. Well, m- maybe that's not how the future looks. Maybe the volatility levels in in it's in other areas. Uh, and by the way, last year volatility was significantly higher than normal in, say, fixed income, for example. Um, and there could be other asset classes. So that's just one thing I thought of. Um, the other thing uh, you mentioned, you mentioned you made a discretionary call. I'm just curious. When you do that, is that in your trend portfolio? Or do you do that just completely separately? Say, okay, I'm just going to buy some bonds, uh, and then I'm also curious to know what's the what was the other discretionary call that you did well uh, in the last ten years? Okay, so this isn't so. So my my trend portfolio, my futures portfolio, is completely automatic, completely systematic, um, and I really I'd like to keep it that way. So you know, I think it would be a big mistake to start kind of. I mean, I don't do it very often, but. Because it kind of pollutes the the, the back test of the strategy, if you like. So I like to keep that doing its own thing. So this is in a, a kind of long only um, sort of risk parity style portfolio that I have with my kind of long only investments, which are mainly composed of ETFs and a few kind of individual UK stocks. Um, so so basically, what I have in there is a handle I can pull, which changes the equity bond allocation from you, you know something like a long term average of maybe like ninety ten eighty five fifteen something like that. Um, and what I did you know, in uh, October was pull that handle and actually load up on on bonds um, more than equities. And I did so deliberately also at the longer end of the curve because I wanted to get the sort of benefits of the additional duration there. Not because I felt that the the curve would, would flatten, uh, which is the other obvious reason for, you know, going further on the curve. It was purely to get the duration risk because uh, this is a non-leveraged portfolio um, and I don't believe in leveraged ETFs. So a very pure way of expressing my opinion would have been just to have um, bought, you know, US 10-year treasury futures or US 5-year treasury futures, uh, or both of those things in 20 years as well. Because I didn't have a view about the shape of the curve. I had a view that the curve was going to come down. But as a, because I'm doing this to part my portfolio where I don't have access to leverage, well, the, the biggest bang for buck was to go for the highest duration, highest vol instruments, which were the longer dated and of the 20, 30 years, which also had the advantage of having of having a higher carry as well, a higher, you know, coupon rate, if you like. So there's sort of a, a lot more bang for my buck there. Um, so that that's that's why I expressed that opinion in that particular way. The other time was COVID. Um, so in March, in March 2020, I, I actually sort of unwound my risk earlier than my, you know, kind of normal long only process would have done. Um, and then I, I tweeted on like, I think it was March the 23rd or something like that. I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was about one or two days away from the bottom in equity markets. So I, pretty, I said, right, this is the bottom. And I started winding that risk back up again and started buying back into equities. Um, so so that's what I did. So, they, so I don't do it very often. And also it doesn't have a big effect. So um, I'm not going from zero to 100 and back again. Um, so if I go back to COVID... I calculated that that you know what I did effectively in pre increase my portfolio performance in in that year by two percent, which you know is is better than that. It's not bad, um, but on a ten, um, on a 10 that, billion dollar portfolio, Rob, that makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, we, unfortunately, I'm not quite running ten billion dollars anymore, but you know, it used to be, but not anymore. Um, so that, but so it's not you know importantly, it's it's a it's only part of my portfolio. It's very occasionally. It's when I have a really strong feeling as that you know this. You know, I'm not trying to call market cycles the whole time. It really is literally in very unusual situations. Um, and um, you know, I guess there's a bias towards me doing it in the fixed income markets because I kind of feel that's where I'm not saying I have an edge necessarily, but I do follow them more than and understand them more than other markets I trade. Um, and I'm doing it in a size that's not really going to make much difference either way, to be honest. So. Two percent here, two percent there. Every few years, you know, it's it's it. You could argue it's not worth it, but it, you know, 
it's, it's the it's, sport. It's the it's the sport. It's exactly. the sport in it. Yeah, I yes. mean this this tedious business of automated trend following. Good grief! How boring yeah. is it? I mean, yeah. the computer does all the work. You know, so it's just it's. Some people go to Vegas. I make discretionary macro calls every few years. You know, everyone everyone has their own their own fun, right? It's funny as you were describing the two calls, I was reminded of those are exactly the same calls that Bill Ackman seems to have made in the last three years. So I wonder if um, if he gets the same call from Powell as you do. But there we are. Let's uh, yeah, leave that I think aside. That, that's an extremely small number of things I have in common with Bill Ackman. I have to say, particularly given his recent. Uh, oh yeah, well let's not go. Let's yeah, not let's, go there. Let's really not go there. All we'll start <laughs> checking our. Uh, dissertations for plagiarism was only probably yeah. okay well let's move on to something uh, more familiar which is uh, you mentioned that trend following has been fairly quiet this uh, year so far i agree with that my trend barometer is weak around 32 and the performance i guess which we'll find out in a second uh, kind of reflects and ties in with that but i will say one thing that is kind of interesting when you look at at least the attributions that i kind of have access to um, there has been a couple of interesting uh, moves one is that uh, you're doing really well if you're long Japanese equities and you're doing really well if you're short uh, Hang Seng. And uh, so uh, so a little bit of action there, uh, not necessarily in the same direction. Um, but other than that, uh, the number so far this year, this month, uh, down 29 basis points as a Wednesday for the B top 50. Uh, Sokjian CTA is down 72 basis points. The trend is down 59 basis points. And the short-term traders index is down 66 basis points. I think yesterday probably they all made a bit of money. So... Uh, it looks a little bit better. MSCI World up about a quarter percent so far this year. Uh, Welcome and Bonds down three quarters of a percent. And the S&P is up about a quarter percent uh, as well. Let's jump into some of these questions. Uh, I'm going to start with the, uh, the first one, which is may also be the longest one for me to read. Uh, we'll see. Uh, it is from a good friend of the show, Norbert. And he writes, I have a challenging question. What is the long-term expectation for the trend following premium as measured by the Sokjian trend index after cost and its stability uh, or sustainability, i.e. Uh, what is the risk it could die out completely as many of the other factors like value or small cap and due to what reason? Some background. In a video cast, Eric Crittenden, who's been a guest on, on our show, estimates the risk of the trend following premium ever dying out in, in, in the distant future at 5 to 10%. This could happen if the vertical integration of large hedges who have so far mainly paid the trend following premium becomes so large across the market that they can hedge most fluctuations internally. In the early days of trend-following managed futures funds until 1990s, their risk-adjusted excess return or, uh, over the money market return would have been only slightly higher than the corresponding equity return. This trend-following excess return would have therefore only fallen slightly to date because it could now be exploited more easily across the board. In the most likely, uh, in the most likely scenario, Eric expects uh, this return to approach the expected equity risk premium of around 5% per annum and remain stable there in the long run. All right, well, I thought of no better than you, Rob, to answer this uh, easy question from, from Norbert. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a trivial question. I, I don't even think it's worthy of an answer, to be honest. It's so easy to answer and very simple as well. Obviously, I'm joking. Uh, great question and very thoughtful. And um, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with all the, some of the premises in the question. So, for example... I don't personally believe that if you take to the value factor that that's been wiped out. I just think that value is a very cyclical thing and there are periods, sometimes long periods, when it doesn't seem to work very well and then it does going to come back or appears to come back. And that that's just people's you know, preferences, um, you know, changing over time, essentially risk preferences for that kind of risk, you know, whether they, you know, so if, you, if people really dislike the value factor, then there'll be a few years when it values really badly and then, you know, inevitably you know, stocks that are value will be so cheap that, that people will start to sniff around and kind of buy into them and then value will become attractive again. Um, and that also is often driven around kind of market cycles as well. So, you know, classically in the tech bubble of 1999 to 2000, you know, value did very badly going into that because everyone loved tech stocks, which were growth stocks. And then coming out of that value did extremely well um, because the, you know, the bubble was driven by tech stocks. 
Um, a lot of the returns, outsized returns, particularly in the US over the last few years, have been driven by tech stocks. Well, in fact, just seven, you know, the so-called magnificent seven stocks. So, um, you know, that that's, again, made value look as if it's done very badly. And um, there have been blips around things like when COVID vaccines came and stuff that made it look better. But, but um, you know, you could you could argue that that perhaps value is due for a comeback. I, I, I'd hesitate to say when that would happen or, you know, how long it would take or anything like that. But I believe it's cyclical, so I think it, it's hard to sort of write it off. Um, trend of momentum is a bit different. So there is some cyclicality there as well. But I think it is fair if you look at, empirically, look at the returns of trend over time. And I'm looking, saying I'm now looking at the last 50 years, which is when my data set goes back um, to, well, slightly before that, so about 1970. Um, other people have gone much further back. So Winton, for example, did this work looking at several hundred years of prices and, and they're seeing um, the momentum premium over time um, as being much more stable. But if I look at since 1970, there is definitely a decline in trend. So trend does very well in the 1970s, not quite as well in the 1980s, and that, that sort of goes forward. But in the last 20 years, it seems to have roughly stabilised. Now, whether that's kind of a thing that's happening you know, so whether the, the, there's a genuine thing going on there, that's um, so. Um, I've not heard the comments made by Eric um, but about you know vertical integration, but if that, for example, is happening, I don't know. Um, if it's a cyclical thing, in other words, if it'll if it'll come back and be stronger again in the near future, again, I don't know. It could just be random chance because trend is it's, it's a relatively weak risk premium, by which I mean it's not something where you make money every month or every every year or even perhaps every decade. It's you know, it does come in and out of fashion, but but more from a kind of luck perspective than a cyclical perspective. So it could just be bad luck. And I don't, you know, I don't know which of those explanations is true. A lot of this comes down to what you believe drives momentum. So, you know, if things are risk premium, then it's working because if people don't like these kinds of risks. People don't like holding stocks, so there's an equity risk premium. People don't like holding long duration bonds, so there's a, you know, there's a there's a kind of carry premium on bonds. People don't seem to like holding assets that have exhibited momentum, so there's a momentum risk premium. Um, so, you know, I, I, that's my my favourite explanation for that. It's this thing down to human behaviour. And as long as the humans are the main actors, the main decision makers, at the kinds of frequencies that we're trading at, so I'm not talking about, you know, HFT where it's all computers now. Uh, as long as humans are the main decision makers at time periods of between, you know, a month, two months, a year, then I believe that, um, you know, those thing kind of patterns in our brain, if you like, as those biases, those things we like, will mean the momentum will continue to work on and off all the time um, into the future. I'm in your camp in, in the sense that I do understand the, the, the question and I, I, I understand that a lot of people like to talk about this idea of a risk premium. And I probably even would understand why uh, Eric, without having heard the, the full explanation, uh, likes to talk about that because they are now in the, in the space where they would, you know, probably not talk so much about trend following, but more how they do in their combined product, which uh, which makes a lot of sense. So narrative is important. Personally, though, I think it's a little bit of a mute point. I think that we can do too much to try and fit trend following into the language of other strategies um, where it may not fit. So so personally, I'm not really into this risk premium for trend following. I mean, why do trend following work? Well, it works because markets move and they move for different reasons at different times. Uh, you know, whether it's human behavior, uh, clearly it is part of that. It's supply and demand, if we come to commodities, uh, economic uh, or changes in in economic uh, uh, environment uh, when we come about the financials, absolutely. But but I'm personally not a, a, a big uh, proponent of trying to make this too theoretical and having to define some kind of uh, risk premium for for a strategy like ours. But I appreciate uh, your your thoughts and your comments. I'm sure uh, Norbert will as well. I mean, the other thing to add, sorry, just to interrupt you, is is even if you know, the risk premium has fallen for trend following, as long as it's uncorrelated with other risk premium, like, so as long as it's relatively uncorrelated with, say, the equity risk premium, then it would still make sense for an investor to hold, you know, trend following in their portfolio. Yeah, but but my, my thought is also, by the way, uh, obviously uh, the firm I work for, we have actual data experience for 49 plus years. And, and all I can see is that actually 
you know, annualized returns in the last 15 years is pretty much the same as it is for the last 40 years. It hasn't changed. It varies a little bit, clearly, uh, depending on the time frame, but it's not hugely different. And even the industry as a whole had one of its best years on record in 2022. That doesn't suggest to me that this strategy is going to go away uh, anytime soon. Uh, so um, anyways, let's leave it at that and jump to a question from Bruno. Bruno writes, Happy New Year to you and your guests. And as always, thanks for the quality content you deliver week in and week out. Well, you're very welcome, Bruno. I have a question for Rob on balancing endogenous and exogenous risk management and controls in a system. In a dynamic position sizing system, the bulk of risk and position management is a direct emanation of signals and volatility estimates. This is entirely left to the system and is happening endogenously. However, this might not be sufficient due to certain limitations in models, assumptions, and market data, so it is not uncommon to have overlays and other circuit breakers. These, these exogenous features uh, alter how the system works and therefore can be construed as meddling with the system. Being pragmatic, we have to strike a balance between the two, so I'd love to hear Rob's golden rules regarding finding this elusive equilibrium. Uh, I can see having overlays uh, on top of endogenous risk management works to control leverage and correlation at a macro level, but would he advocate a hard stop loss and performance thresholds at which the system would be forced to liquidate positions, reduce leverage, correlation, and other key risk parameters? And how can he justify any of these hard stops uh, as not meddling with the system? Well, that was a tricky one to get through with all these egg dodges and yeah no no it's fine but but i i understand under, you know it's quite a nice question for me because this difference in endogenous and exogenous risk management is something i've written about before and i suspect bruno has probably read um read those posts from me um so basically if you think about the kind of way that you know most well systematic strategies of all kinds not just trend following it's constructed um, they nearly all have an element of estimating the risk of positions in them and sizing positions accordingly. And if you like, that is kind of risk management 101 because you're effectively you know, saying, this is how risky I think the world is. This is how much risk I want to take. Therefore, you know, this, you know, this is how confident I'm about my positions. Therefore, this is the direction I want to go in. Therefore, this is the risk I want to take. You're putting all those things together. So in a sense, these systems do their own risk management and, you know, the fancy way of saying that is that it's an endogenous Greek, you know, endogenous risk management. Endogenous just means, you know, within the system. Um, now, the problem with that is, is that, um, you know, it may do stuff that you don't like, you know. So, for example, um, you may have all of this very good endogenous risk management, but one day you wake up and your system's got, a, a, you know, astonishing leverage. It's got massive notionally sized positions on uh, and the reason for that is probably because volatility has fallen a lot and therefore the automatic risk scaling has increased your position accordingly. Um, or you might wake up one day and look at your positions and be like, oh, my crikey, all these positions are really highly correlated. Because um, in the current market environment, you know, bonds and stocks are positively correlated and I'm, I'm, I'm long bonds and long stocks, therefore I'm massively exposed to this, you know, the fact, the risk of them both going down together. Um, so what what you can do is... is um, um, if apply what I call an exogenous risk management, you know, there are kind of different ways of doing this. The one way is just a very manual discretionary way. And actually, in my experience, in, in a lot of um, mostly systematic funds, shall we say, the risk management decisions often could be discretionary, potentially. Because, you know, you could argue that the risk, the risk manager's job in a systematic fund is basically to stop the computer from doing something stupid. And that can only ever be a discretionary decision. So that, that's one point of view, and it's it's potentially quite valid. Um, it's to say, you know, well, there's something going on now, or there's some conditional, some combination of positions such that we're very uncomfortable with the risk, and therefore we want to do something about it. Um, now, I take a sort of somewhat stricter view and say, well, actually, ideally, I don't want any human discretionary involvement, even in this part of the process. And this, you know, although it's exogenous risk management, it lives outside the core system. I think it should still be a system. It should still have rules set out to say things like, for example, if your leverage is bigger than X, then do Y. 
um, you know, if if your correlation matrix is 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 like this, then then change your positions accordingly to reflect that. Um, and I I have the you know rules in place that do things like that. Now, as Bruno points out, the, the problem with that approach is that the more you do of that, the more you distort the system and make it different. Now, let's let's take a, a kind of really, what well, an analogy that hopefully will make some sense. So imagine that you're driving around, around a, you know, a racetrack in your car, and obviously you're adjusting your speed according to the, the corners and where you are on the track and the weather conditions and things like that. And, and then your risk manager comes along and says, well, you know, you're driving this car very fast at times, so what I'm going to do is put a speed limiter on your on your car, so you can't go more than, you know, 100 and say say 200 kilometers an hour. And actually, that's not going to have any effect at all if, when you were naturally driving, you were going more more than say 195 kilometers an hour. If you never get to 200, then that speed limiter has no effect. It's only there on the you know the kind of off chances thing it, weird happens like maybe you lose control of the accelerator something something goes on the engine and the car suddenly speeds up then the automatic system will kind of top your speed off um and an analogy might be that let's say in the back test you never lose more than say i don't know 25 percent you know max and drawdown is 25 percent you you might put into things saying well it, you know i've got a 40-year back test here it's un- very unlikely that i'll lose more than be a bit pessimistic say 30 35 percent so I have, if I ever get to 35%, I'm going to shut the system down completely or I'm going to reduce my positions in some way. So it's, it's a limit you never expect to hit. So it's not going to change the kind of expected behavior of a system. The problem comes when you're driving around your track and your, your risk manager says, well, you know, this, this 200 kilometers an hour is still very fast. I'm going to limit you to 150. And that's going to mean in practice that every time you're going down the straight and you put your foot down, you're going to get to 150 and the car's not going to go any faster. So it's going to change quite a lot the expected behavior of your system. Um, so the more these things bind, the more your system sort of kind of gets affected. And there's no real kind of, you know, rule for this. Um, what I, I again, I, I like to be systematic. I like to have rules that I use. So what I say is, well, actually, I'm going to set my system up such that 95% of the time it's completely unaffected by these additional constraints. So that's like saying, in you know, 95% of the time, I'm never going to hit that speed limiter as I'm driving around the circuit. 5% of the time, I'm happy to be in a situation where I'm being slowed down slightly. And that's going to reduce my performance a little bit. Um, but what it's kind of like doing is sort of a little bit like paying an insurance premium. Um, in fact, if you're doing something where you say reduce your leverage or shut down your system at a certain level of loss, to get kind of geeky for a minute, what you're effectively doing is buying a synthetic out of the money put option on your performance. So you're sort of protecting yourself from your performance going below a certain level. Um, and you, but you're doing that synthetically by effectively delta hedging your portfolio r- rather than going to a bank or something and saying, here, can I, can I buy this put option on my performance? Um, cause you can only do that if you're like, well, Renaissance did it to avoid tax. That's another story. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I do like these risk constraints because I'm running my system automatically. I don't have the time to make discretionary calls on performance. And I, I, I feel you shouldn't do that if you, it's something you could systematize. But I don't believe they should bind very often. And for me, the rule of thumb is, you know, 95% of the time I should, my system should be running normally and only very occasionally should it kind of change its behavior because it hits a risk limit. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting uh, discussion. Yesterday I was recording an episode that comes out uh, on Wednesday with uh, Jim and David Dredge. And they're both incredibly insightful when it comes to some of these risks. Uh, clearly, they're both involved in the ball space. And actually, Dave has written, uh, he writes wonderfully every month uh, on his uh, Convex Strategies um, uh, handle on LinkedIn. Um, and he's written about this race car analogy in a different way, uh, where, where basically he says, well, the car that's going to win, and therefore the investment strategy, if you put it into our world, is the one that has the best brakes, right? So it allows you to actually go really fast, but you know it has really good brakes. Um, I think to a large extent, I think trend following actually fits that quite well. But what he also says, and, and people should listen to the conversation um, because I'm, I'm not re- remembering every word of it, but he's basically saying that too many people are optimizing their portfolios and maybe even our systems, if we look at it as managers, you know, for the mean. We don't want to get too far away from the mean. We don't want to be this outlier losing a lot one year and making a lot the next year. But that's really what we should do. And certainly as a manager, as an overall portfolio manager, you need to also uh, optimize for the for these um, 
uh, let's call them outliers. We we call them that, or or or, or the dispersion, or the can't remember the virgins. Actually, what is what what he said. So it is an interesting thing uh, in the sense that should we be scared of the occasional time where our systems gets a lot of conviction, let's put it that way, in, in our positions, or should we welcome it? Because that is where the, the big performance might come. Um, so interesting. Let's jump to the next question from Oliver. Uh, Oliver writes, uh, hope you're well. Looking very much forward to all upcoming TTU podcast. Rob made a call for questions regarding his upcoming episode, and here we go. What's your take on trading single stocks instead of stock indices in a diversified multi-asset trend following program? What effect might this have on total uh, fund uh, metrics like returns, volatility, skewness, correlation to stock market, uh, beta, etc.? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Thanks, Oliver. Well, why is our good friend Jerry writing in under a pseudonym, I have to ask myself? <laughs> yes. Um, as he is a, a well-known fan of the single stock. Um, okay, single stocks. So, obviously, one of the interesting things about stocks is, so if I'm trading, say, crude oil futures, I can't decompose them anymore. You know, I can't. I can't go into like different different grades of crude or something like that. But if I'm trading, say, the S and P 500 index, um, what I'm effectively trading is is a you know a basket of of 500 stocks, um, and I have the alternative option of trading those stocks individually. And there are obvious benefits. In doing that, potentially, um, so diversification is a good thing, um, and you know, having owning more instruments is is better. So you know, it's pro it, you could argue that in going from you know one S and P five hundred index to five hundred stocks, you're opening yourself up to five hundred more kind of opportunities to to trade different instruments, and therefore that should give you additional diversification. Um, and uh, you know, this is especially true if, as we say so often on this show. You know, something like correlation is not necessarily a very good measure of the kind of non-linear outliers you can get from a strategy like trend following. Um, so although the S&P 500 stocks are quite well correlated, like maybe correlation of under 0.7, uh, and on paper at least, you know, you're not going to get a lot of diversification through trading them um, because of that high correlation compared to trading, say, something like like wheat, which has got a correlation with S&P of zero or negative. So it's a good it's a good thing to own. Uh, those individual stocks. Um, so that that's you know an obvious benefit of, of, of doing of doing this. And you know, in to an, to answer the, the the question in terms of returns, vol, skewness, correlation, so on and so forth. So I would, exp I mean, volatility. You know, so that the individual stocks are going to have sort of let's be say slightly wilder volatility properties than the index. So you know, there's a, they've got more kind of potential for very high positive or very high negative skewness for example they've got more potential to do crazy stuff than the than the um you know the index as a whole because the index as a whole is obviously you know built up of things and that often hedge each other even in so it doesn't suffer from some idiosyncratic risk correlation to um stock market beta well again it depends on what you're doing so if if you've already got like a kind of bog standard set of cta futures which is going to include the s p 500 you know, the FTSE, the DAX, the Euro stocks, and so on and so forth. If you then add on to that the individual 500 stocks, um, then clearly, if you just do that dumb thing, then you're you're going to be massively overweight stocks in, in your, your portfolio, which means, of course, if, if stocks are going up, then your, your overall portfolio beat as the stocks is going to be much higher. But you're probably not going to do that. I mean, you, if you've got any sense, what you're probably going to do is, is sort of say, well, I started off with, say, a 20... 20% allocation to stocks, which originally I got through exposure to indices. Now I'm going to move to getting that exposure through individual equities and maybe the indices as well, especially in countries perhaps where you can't or don't want to trade the individual stocks for whatever reason. But I'm going to, and I might increase that allocation to stocks a little bit to reflect the fact that I've got this additional diversification, which gives, gives me a bit better expected performance. But, you know, you're, you're not going to sort of go from having a 20% allocation to stocks to having a 90% allocation to stocks, that, that would be a silly thing to do. You should just keep that way to stocks the same or a little bit smaller. So those are all the lots and lots of good reasons to do it. And, you know, if I was running a multi-billion dollar CTA and I had 50 or 150 people working for me, I would be trading individual stocks. Um, so that that's, you know, no arguments there. The reason I don't personally do them is I'm not running a multi-billion dollar CTA. I don't have 50 or 150 people working for me. Um, and actually trading stocks as an additional asset class 
you can trade stocks in quite smallish chunks. Although, you know, with some of the bigger US stocks, you do run up against kind of size effects, um, which make it hard to trade all 500 S&P 500, 500 stocks with a sort of retail sized account, even the, you know, sort of reasonable size one like I've got. Um, okay, you could go down the route of fractional shares, but those brokers tend not to smell so nice, shall we say. Um, so there's a kind of sizing issue for a retail account, but the, the main the main reason I don't personally do it is is just, you know, the work involved. And there are other things as well, like you've got to be able to short them, so that means you've got to borrow them, and there's a lot of mechanics around that. And in your, you know, the back testing is a lot more complicated. You need to know about borrowing fees and stock availability. You need to know about short constraints and, you know, okay, you can make it long only, but then you, and, and then short on with, you know, and then short with the future. So there are ways, there are ways around these things, but, but, you know, ge- generally speaking, you know, I would say rule of thumb, going from a kind of classic future CTA to a futures plus stock CTA, you're probably roughly tripling the amount of work involved, I would say, as a rule, you know, that's my kind of gut feeling back of the envelope for maybe a 10 to 20% increase in returns. And that's clearly worth it if your fund's big enough, but it's not for me. You know, I think all your points are very valid. So thank you for sharing. Uh, What I would love would be for someone actually to show the difference, because clearly we know people who uh, have done just the futures and and now trade the single stocks. But I'd love to see uh, a back test of that or even live trading would be great. Um, Because my gut feeling is the following. I think it sounds in theory, like a smart thing to do, maybe, disregarding all the operational hassle. But it's, for me, maybe a little bit like this thing about, well, maybe we should trade 300 markets or 400 markets instead of the 75 most liquid markets. And I think that the performance probably is going to be more or less the same, um, but I think it will be different. Just like if you trade 300 markets or 400 markets, you're going to have different performance at different times. I don't think it's better. Uh, in the long run. I haven't seen any evidence of that. So yeah, I think it's a it's a good positioning. I think it's a good narrative. But does it, in, in, in actual um, dollars and cents, make a difference? Um, I would question that. But until I see the evidence, of course, then I would change my mind if if I'm proven wrong. Just so it's very quickly, Neil. So, that, so would that be like a back test, which, let's be honest, you could torture to prove anything, or would you, were you talking about sort of live track records? And if so, how, how long would that need to be? So... Um, I mean, of course, if people uh, are doing an honest back test and they include all the fees and the borrowing costs and all that hassle, of course, we can't take into account that sometimes you're not even allowed to short stocks uh, when there's a crisis and you really need to short them. You may not be allowed to do it, but be that as it may, if there was a, a proper, well-done back test uh, over the last uh, 10, 20 years um, where you replace, say, your 20% uh, based on futures with your uh, 20% based on individual equities, um, I think that's a good starting point. I don't think, I only really know of of one, uh, uh, namely Jerry, that has embraced it, but I don't think he's embraced it for that long, so it's probably a bit too early to have actual experience to to show the difference. Um, so I think, I think Win- Winton have been doing it for maybe 10 years. That's my yeah, understanding. Yeah, but obviously uh, they're not going to disclose to me <laughs> what the difference is between that and... and uh, but yeah, anyways, um, it will definitely be a, a, a topic I'm sure for uh, for the for the future as well all right we move on to critter critter writes curious what would the minimum look back period to be considered long term in the trend following space See, uh, seeing many funds that close their US bond shorts and claim to be medium to long term obviously there's no right answer so how would you answer that? Uh, it's a, obviously it's a very subjective question. I mean, uh, you know, as far as I know, that there's like kind of official standard in the industry, and there's no, you know, there's no uh, low, low, low light SEC rule that says you can't call yourself a long term unless your holding period is at least X. Um, I would say that one one way of thinking about this is if if you look at the sort of trend following signals that I trade, at least their efficacy tends to worsen with holding periods of significantly less than a month. So. When you get down to like a week, you, the, the signal tends to look really bad even before costs. Obviously, you've got costs which are higher on top of that. Um, so I, I would, you know, I'd be surprised if, if you know, you, your holding period is a week and you were calling yourself long term. I think that's, to me, that's short term, personally. Um, and we can argue about what medium term is. 
But then I know of people who say, well, you know, um, and actually some some people who um, I think Rich, for example, would say, well, you know, lo- you know, he thinks long term is is like a, you know over a year. Um, and um, again, I I think if you look at the efficacy of trend following, it actually starts to deteriorate at that point. So um, you know, to me that that seems like you know that you're no longer almost a trend following manager if your whole average holding period is say two years. You know, at least in my opinion. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, for me personally, at least a month, and there are probably lots of people who'd say that even that's too quick to be considered long-term. Yeah, I would say that, uh, uh, from my experience, I would say one month is definitely too quick, but I will say that it's a challenging question and I'll explain critter why I mean that. And that is because, um, there are many things that, uh, how you can actually define it. Uh, so one way would be say, well, we can define it as holding period. Yes. But most CTAs don't do it on a trade-by-trade trade basis anymore. It's an exposure to a market, and therefore it could be made up by lots of smaller sub-signals, so to speak. And and therefore it's hard to say holding period as 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 a concept. So that's one thing. Maybe you could measure kind of your average uh, exposure period to a market before you go uh, you reverse the signal. But that would be one way. But the other thing, and then maybe that's more speaking from personal experience, and that is. Um, at least on our side, we can have certain uh, lookbacks that you can define and you say, well, that's kind of the term in terms of how long it takes for us to get into a trade. So the entry you can very easily define in terms of your lookback. But actually getting out can be influenced by um, many things. You can obviously have a simple system that uses exactly the same rule to get out. But then you also have, for the most part, people who use stops or other ways of getting out. And they can be much more dynamic uh, than just a, a simple look back period. And that makes it hard to uh, pinpoint, uh, especially when he talks about, um, you know, that some managers have already gotten out of their uh, short bonds. Sure, but that can be influenced by uh, something that is not related necessarily to getting a new buy signal uh, if it's a reversal system. So anyways, it is obviously a topic that will always be there. It's a typical... Yeah. Yeah, just very, very quickly on your first point, Niels, you're right, it's hard to define holding periods. So what I do is I look at my my turnover and I just say, what's one divided by that? So if on average I'm turning over my average position 10 times a year, then I say, well, that means my holding period is about five weeks. Um, so yeah, it's not it's not a trade-by-trade trade thing because of course I'm continuously adjusting my exposure. It's it's effectively the inverse of my, of my um, turnover that I define as a holding period. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. All right, last question, then we move on to some really juicy stuff that you brought along. Uh, it's a question that came in just a, a little while ago from Chris. Chris Wright, our firm is an RA based in Aspen, Colorado. That sounds wonderful at this time of year. We use a trend-following systematic trading strategy applied to portfolios of index ETFs. Can you share a couple of names of software companies that do robust backtesting of trade strategies? We want to validate our strategy beyond all of the backtesting we've done by hand. Thanks very much. So I don't know anything about uh, backtesting systems because we do all our own, uh, so to speak. Um, but I know you've written about it. Um, so yeah, I, I do all my own as well. Um, and, um, I don't really know of anyone, this is going to sound a bit insulting, but anyone serious that doesn't do their own. Um, I think that, you know, that there probably are, so there, there's a, so there's kind of a, there's, there's some retail backtesting products, but I'm guess this person is far too serious to use those. Um, and then obviously you've got the stuff that that you know that is if you if you've got a reasonable size hedge fund, you're almost certainly going to have got you've written your own stuff almost certainly. Um, now that, and there's a middle ground, I suppose, where where people do use third party products, and I've I've heard of you know every now and then people say oh, I should use X or Y or Z. Um, my understanding is a lot of them are really aimed at single stocks. So, um, the, the, you know, the, for, in the future space, I don't think there's this much out there. Um, I'm really, I'm always really reluctant to, to recommend stuff when I've never used it myself. And, and, and I don't even, I'm not even in the market for using it. So it's like saying to me, you know, um, really, you know, Rob, what would you recommend as, as the best, um, I'm trying to think of a product that I don't use, um, that isn't an item of ladies clothing. Um, which would probably get me into trouble, but but if you if you ask said to me you know Rob would you recommend insert name of ladies clothing here I'm like well I don't I don't have a need for it I don't wear it myself um, it's just not my thing um, I'm you know it's, it's, that that's your thing brilliant 
So I've no, you know, I can't recommend it to you. I've, I, I might have heard that X, Y, or Z is a good pack testing software, but, but you know, without personal experience. I mean, the, the bigger question is, should you use somebody else's or should you write your own? It is a difficult one because, you know, writing your own is a massive upfront investment in time. But in the long run, it's always better to write your own because of the flexibility and control it gives you. Um, it's not necessarily cheaper. I mean, it, it, you know, in fact, unless you're a big enough firm with decent economies of scale, it probably is, isn't is cheaper. And logically, it can't be. Um, but, but, you know, most most people will find that the moment they want to do something that's go slightly outside what the software that can do, you, you're faced with either trying to hack it to get it to work or get the firm that sold it to you to customize it, which is a pain and potentially giving away IP as well, um, or you end up just writing it yourself. So I, I think that's why most people end up writing it themselves. Yeah, I mean, obviously it also depends on how complicated the trend strategy that Chris wants to backtest, how how complicated it is, because I do know that some online brokerage platforms, um, if it's a simple kind of, I don't know, moving average type strategy, or if it's a longer term breakout strategy, I mean, you could probably uh, do it via some of those uh, platforms and if it's an ETF so obviously these ETFs will typically be in the uh, on, on the platforms nowadays so I, I yeah I'm sorry we, Chris we can't give you a, a, a better more specific answer but I hope you understand why we're careful recommending anything we don't know and have personal experience with that would be silly of us uh, really to do but we appreciate the question and we love the fact that you do trend following in your RIA All right, Rob, we're finally here. Crypto ETFs have been approved. 10 years after the Winklevoss brothers first proposed a Bitcoin ETF in 2013. But who really won? Uh, I know you want to talk about something different, but I just want to, I, I want to ask you maybe up front a, a completely different question that you might expect. And that is, I thought that the Bitcoin idea was to have something that was decentralized, unregulated, etc. Now we have ETFs, so now we're back into the regulated and centralized world of finance. So is it such a great idea, do you think, for the crypto world? So I, I, love, I love this question, and I, I've, I've been trying to actually formulate a, a way of saying this, exactly this on Twitter, but my thoughts are too complex to fit into 140 characters, and although the, the character limit has been extended, I refuse to to, to, you know, to I, I think writing a five thousand word diatribe on Twitter is isn't the right thing to do, which is another another thing that Bill Ackman and I disagree on. Yeah, so you're right. So the the way I see Bitcoin is it's this massive chicken and egg problem. So th there must be a, a must be something that Bitcoin is useful for for it to have value, right? It doesn't. It's not something that has like an, an intrinsic value. So you know, finance one hundred and one. It must be something that produces a stream of cash flows either now or in the future. You know, so. Um, it must give you some ownership of something, and you, you know. So you could say, well, if it's if it really is the future of money, the future of money is anonymous. The future of money is decentralized. The future of money is thousands of servers mining mining stuff and validating transactions, and that is the future. And if you also then think that that you know one specific currency effectively has the monopoly on that. Um, so you don't believe, for example, that yes, that's the future of money, but it's going to be central bank digital currencies. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be not not going to be decentralized, but it is. It's not going to be anonymous, but it is going to be in this blockchain form. And if you and if you don't, you know, you might say, well, the blockchain itself has some has some value in it. You know, as a, as a there are other use cases of blockchain works. Well, that may be true, but you don't need to own Bitcoin or you know, insert name of your favorite cryptocurrency here or ICO or whatever to, to do that. So it must, there must be something that is good for, but something has value. And I, you know, Bitcoin's now been around for, for 14 years, approximately 15 years. And there's no evidence that it's actually being used for the purpose for which you describe. There's no evidence that lots of people are using it for, for payment. You know, I would put a finger in the air and say that, you know, the number of Bitcoin transactions that are a payment for something is got to be less than one percent. Maybe someone's done some serious research on this, but but I'd be astonished because there just aren't people going around buying stuff with Bitcoin. It's, you know, it's actually something that's very very hard to do, and yeah, it's actually still very hard to um, 
to use Bitcoin in its intended purposes. It's very hard to, you know, buy Bitcoin in a de- on an anonymous decentralized way and store it on a, a cold wallet, which is the way, you know, the way you should do it. What instead has become easier and easier and therefore and has, has become a much the, the thing that Bitcoin is being used for is purely as a speculative asset. So it's very easy to trade Bitcoin on an exchange. Okay, various regulators have been trying to make it harder and, and so on and so forth. Um, often those exchanges now have KYC requirements, so it's no longer anonymous. Um, you know, the, the, there's no, uh, most, most people um, um, put kind of so-called fiat money in, buy their, you know, Bitcoin or maybe use Tether or another um, stable coin as a, a, you know, sort of transition bridge between them, um, do their buying and selling of Bitcoin and then, and then, you know, sell it when they made a profit. They don't then go out and use the Bitcoin to buy stuff. I know. So it's pure, pure speculative asset. And so the market demand has become, well, we need to make this speculative asset as easy as possible for as many people as possible to, to trade. Um, and so that's why, you know, we have exchanges that are increasingly becoming under the purview of the SEC and having to do KYC, having to do compliance, why the FCA at the start of this year has made it said to exchanges, you know, you've got to actually have risk warnings and 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 tests for to make sure people could do can trade these products. You know, in the UK, it's quite hard to trade now. For example, crypto derivatives, you need to show that you're um, a sophisticated customer under the EU rules that we ironically still follow. You know, so that all of this stuff's come in, and 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 now we have the final kind of, well, I know the final accomplishment, which is to basically effectively synthetically create a proper financial asset that is regulated, tradable on normal exchanges, you know, so it's something that they, in every possible way is a normal financial asset, which means that anyone can, who can buy or sell ETFs can, can buy or sell this thing pretty much if you're in the US. It's not, you know. Um, and then inside it is this other thing, this other weird thing, but let's put as many layers around it to make it as unlike what it's originally supposed to be as possible. So, uh, you know, either... It is the future of money, in which case, well, it has potential, maybe it has a value. But if so, why? You know, that's not the direction we've been heading in. We're going more and more the direction of just being, you know, this 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 thing that you buy and sell. And um, as I said on the podcast before, you know, I'm I'm retained as a as a research advisor to a crypto hedge fund. Um, and this is my way of repaying them. <laughs> um, despite my, you know, my well known animosity towards towards crypto. And, um, you know, but the, the, the CEO of that fund, he, he is a very way of, he said, look, look, if crypto is like anything, it's like, it's like modern art. It has no real intrinsic value, but people seem willing to, to, to trade it. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if there, there, there is already an ETF where you can have a bunch of modern art stuck inside it or some cars or some watches or some whiskey or all of these other weird assets that people like, like to, to buy and sell that, that don't have any tangible value well actually whiskey cars and and do have some tangible value and if you're an art lover you could argue that you know uh, uh, having a Rothko or a Pollock on your wall has some intangible value as well and does, doesn't work for me but 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 yeah it, it's I'm I don't know what to say I'm speechless well I will make you unspeechless if there's a word such a word and that is because as much as you can argue that it has no intrinsic value and it's just pure speculative product, once we get it into an exchange form, once we get into a certain liquid form, once we get it into a form where the co- transaction costs uh, are, are, are reasonable and low and so on and so forth, it actually ends up becoming valuable potentially for investors from a diversification point of view. So, And, and I know you... Uh, recently wrote a blog post about uh, maybe rebutting uh, a a tweet, uh, I'm not entirely sure, uh, of someone who suggests that actually, and it's almost like trend following, uh, you do some kind of optimization to see what's the optimal allocation, and it's like 50 or 60%. Uh, Clearly, uh, very few people, unfortunately, will end up having 50 or 60% in trend following. And I think uh, the the person who uh, uh, wrote uh, about this uh, came with a 84.9% allocation to Bitcoin. So I'm going to let you tell the story from here. Yeah, so basically um, there was a paper written, I think it was a couple of years ago, by three three guys who work, worked out, I don't know if they still work at, at um, BlackRock, 
Um, and, um, you know, the, the, they they used a lot of kind of economic theory and analysis and, and, and stuff like that, and numbers. And, and, and they wrote this paper. And, you know, if you read the, the, the paper is actually the kind of basic idea behind the paper. Right, it can be summarized very easily. If you like assets with positive skew, Bitcoin has positive skew. Therefore, you should own lots of Bitcoin. That this 84.9% figure is literally one figure in a 50-page paper that, of course, someone has pulled out of context. So I'm not going to blame the original authors because, but that, you know, I know from experience, if you write 50 pages and you include one thing in there that's controversial, then that's what people are going to focus on. They're going to pull out and say, look, these three experts working for BlackRock say you should have 84% of your portfolio in crypto. You know, if you've got less than that, and I, the, the original guy on Twitter said, um, if you've got less than that, you know, you're not bullish enough sort of thing. So, um, the, the, you know, the, and this sort of abuse of kind of economic theory and optimization statistics kind of goes on all the time. But, but of course, this is crypto land. So the, 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 the offenses are even more egregious than, than they are normally. So um, I, I wrote a blog post which basically pointed out a number of issues I had with the, well, taking a, one figure out of context out of a much richer, more interesting paper. Obviously, that's the offense of the people on Twitter and the crypto bulls who will literally use any piece of evidence whatsoever to support their their case. So I'm, I'm very sure that if the SEC hadn't approved um, spot ETFs, then the crypto bulls on Twitter would have come up with some reason why that was bullish, you know. Oh, you know, well, now we haven't got the the the, the kind of cold, dead hand of, of um, you know, tradfi on our shoulders that we can really go to the moon with this thing, you know. Anyway, that, that's another story. Um, so, um, the, 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 so there's the pulling the car out of context, not the fault of the people in the original paper, but the, the original paper, I mean, it's, a, you know, the basic idea that you look at the, the, the history of a price of a returns of some assets and you do some kind of optimization and then you say, well, this is the optimal value in your portfolio. So that that process, that three-step process, if you like, um, there's you know, nothing wrong with it in theory. The the problem is if you misunderstand or abuse what, what's going on. And I'm always I do I do these kinds of exercises quite a lot, as you alluded to, Neil, as I did one with last year with, with trend following. And I said, well, under this particular you know, and I, I can I could do I could produce figures of allocations to trend following of eighty five percent very you know, eighty four point nine percent very easily. But what I'm always very careful to do is to say, well, it depends on at least three key assumptions. Assumption number one is that the history of the price going forward will be like it was in the past. Assumption number two is that the the, the assumptions you're making, and this is in this particular paper, this is very important. The assumptions you're making about what people's preferences are, what people like, are correct. And, and in this specific case, people's preferences for skew. Um, and the third assumption is is to say, well, you know, whatever comes out of the optimizer, that's what you should do. And that that's an assumption you should never make because, well, first of all, it relies on the first two assumptions. And 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 we, thirdly, you know, anyone who dumbly believes what comes out of an optimizer and wants to use that as their allocation is a bit nuts. And to be fair, you know, the original writers don't do that. They say, well, there's very much, you know, these papers are written like, well, this is an interesting experiment. If we put these numbers into this op into this equation, this is the answer we get. Isn't that interesting? And, and you know, the correct way of interpreting is to go that, is to go, oh, that is very interesting, actually. The incorrect way is to say, look at this number here. So 84.9%, you know, let's go to the moon. It's not the right way of doing it. So I'm always very careful when I do these things to say, you know, here's here are my results, but, you know, take it with a pinch of salt because it relies on X, Y, and Z. So just kind of going into the assumptions made in that paper specifically. So one thing they do is they take crypto pay data back to, I think it's January 2010, uh, Bitcoin prices specifically. Now, I'm normally a big fan of using as much data as possible. I said to you earlier in, in the discussion that my data set goes back to 1970, and I'd like more data. I'd, I'd be, I'd love to have, you know, Winton's 300 years of cotton prices or whatever they use, because, you know, we the more data, the more statistical significance, the better things are. But there is a significant difference between, say, saying, well, I don't think, I think the prices of, say, I don't know, gold in the 1970s. I think there are important lessons that we can learn from how gold traded in the 1970s and apply those today. You know, obviously the world is very different now, but, you know, if you're doing a long back test that kind of averages over lots of historical periods, then it's fair enough. But the nature of Bitcoin has changed so much since January 2010. So 
I'm, I'm trying to, oh, the, the, what's the, you know, if you want to say, well, what's the market cap of Bitcoin, for example? Um, so I can't, I, I don't know, the, these numbers are going to be complete, probably wrong, but I think there are about 10 million Bitcoins in existence to the first order approximation. And let's say the price is about $30,000 to first order approximation. So 30,000 30, times 10 million is, what, 3 billion? Sounds right, but I, I know the numbers are not right, but, yeah. but if, you, if that anyway, was true... Anyway, it's, yeah, yeah. it's billions, it's billions, you know, maybe 300 billion. It's, it's a big number. Do you know what the market cap of Bitcoin was on January the 1st, 2010? No. Have a guess. I have no idea. It's have a very a small problem. Yeah. It's about $150,000. So... It was like a penny stock of a penny stock of a penny stock. You know, it was just this tiny, tiny irrelevant thing. Um, and so for me, so the first problem I have with this paper is that there's, the, you know, to say, well, let, we think that the way that Bitcoin traded in 2010, you know, that the sort of average return, the skewness and the, the standard deviation, all these things they measure is relevant to how it's trading now. And I just think that's absurd, you know, because it, it was, it was the, it was like a neighborhood grocery store in terms of market cap. And now it's got it's a, it's got a market cap that's equivalent to the GDP of a decent sized country. Um, so just, you know, so that that's the first problem I have. Um, the other problem is to do with the the way that, that they, they sort of talk about these, this preference for skewness. Because uh, because Bitcoin is positively skewed, to say, well, if you like positive skewness, you'll love Bitcoin is just, I mean, it's, it's a self-reinforcing prophecy. It's a stretch. But... It's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> and it's not. It's just, yeah, exactly. Um, but as I pointed out in, in this blog post I wrote about it, well, I might as well just say, well, you know, if you like positive skewness, you'll love lottery tickets. Yeah. Lottery tickets are the most positively skewed asset that, that, that exists. You know, you take a small loss 99.99999% of the time, and every now and then you win, win the jackpot. Um, so, uh, and, you know, there are people who like buying lottery tickets. Um you know, there are people who, and it tends, unfortunately, to be people with less money who spend probably a bigger percentage of their income on lottery tickets and other forms of gambling than they should do. Um, so I'm not denying that, you know, that there are people out there who like who like positive skew to the extent that they will make decisions about optimization, which to people who don't like positive skew as much are incorrect. Um, but that doesn't mean that Everyone should spend, you know, yes, okay, if, if you are some, so basically, you know, the paper can be summed up as saying something like, if you really like positive skew, and if you believe that the way that Bitcoin's behaved over the last 14 years, including in 2010, when it had the market cap of a grocery store, is is likely to repeat itself in the future, then then yes, you should put most, if not all of your wealth in Bitcoin. Um, but that's just proving mathematically what is just common sense like if you have extremely unrealistic expectations of a return of a particular asset and you really like the characteristics of that asset then yeah put all of your money in there and um yeah and it, so although this is a bit of a rant sorry to, to listeners but there is a serious point here which is you know this idea about preferences of skewness is something that, that is i've written about before and it's actually quite interesting because you know going back to trend following because you know that's why we're here Trend following is a positive skewed asset as well. And, you know, the, the, the work, work I've done before says, does say things like, if you like positive skewness, well, then you should have a bit more trend following in your portfolio than, than someone who doesn't. You know, effectively, that, that's, you know, it's the same, effectively the same maths, if you like, but it's a, a significantly less extreme, extreme version of it. But I could just as easily as say, well, if you think trend following is going to, you know, make, have a sharp of two and, make 50% a year, then you should put 90% of your portfolio into it. Well, yeah, that's mathematically correct, but I'm I'm certainly not saying that either of those things are true, just because that mathematical equation follows. You, know, you won't see me on Twitter saying, you know, <laughs> oh, I've written this and it's you should put 84.9% of your portfolio in trend following. You aren't bullish enough. You'll never see me me doing that. Definitely not. Good. All right. Um, that's reassuring. And um, however... <laughs> However, just to set the record straight, um, the market cap for Bitcoin at the moment is $852 billion, uh, and the price is around $43,689. Um, so so that's, like, um, that's like the GDP of like the Netherlands or something, right? 
I have no idea, Belgium. but I can yeah. also uh, I can also tell you that uh, there are 19.6 million bitcoins, and of course we all know that it is capped at 21 million. So um, the real scary number that came from this page that I found uh, is the fact that there are 94.6 billion uh, market cap. Oh, sorry, supply of tether. That's anyways different discussion. Before we end for today, you did want to talk a little bit about something we rarely talk about, which is uh, forecasting uh, or not forecasting, but looking into the future. And you found, um, I guess, one of your, maybe even one of your old colleagues, uh, Henry Neville from Man Solutions, who had written a piece about looking into 2024. He is, of course, uh, very quick to point out in the beginning that it is not a house view because they don't have a house view. But I'm, I was kind of curious when you brought it up uh, in terms of where you want to go with this. Yeah, well, so um, the start of the year or the end of the year, all the investment banks and, and big portfolio managers often produce these kind of year-end reports straight for looking ahead forecasts. And I mean, some of them, I think the JP Morgan one is like 850 pages and probably took, you know, 30 man years to produce. So I, I'm certainly not going to read that. Um, so, um, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to read one of these things, just one. And I chose this one, A, because of obviously I used to work for man. I've just, you know, obviously a, a kind of, little warm feeling when I, I look at them, even though I don't own shares in them anymore. Um, and they're also, secondly, because it's short. <laughs> and thirdly, because, um, as you sort of imply, unlike almost all of these other forecasters, it's like, it's quite amusingly written with, with a massive pinch of, you know, we don't know, really know what's going to go, or what's going to happen. Um, you know, so it's not really so much a forecast as a kind of, you know, a series of comments about, well, you know, eh, uh, so, for example, the last section reads, the headline last section is, some concluding remarks given with much humility and a compliance disclaimer. Uh, and then starts, we've all been fumbling in the dark. I've been wrong plenty of times. This is not investment advice and do your own research. So I, I think that's exactly the kind of approach that, that you should take if if you are going to gonna do this kind of year-end stuff. So um, so I'll very quickly read out what, what Henry is suggesting may or may not happen. Risk parity, 60-40, doesn't look too exciting. You know, forward-looking um, expectations aren't great, but the, the stock bond correlation looks like it might be improving. In other words, going closer to zero again, so that would be good for, for risk parity. So that, that's probably good. Bonds look a little bit better than equities on a risk-adjusted basis. Uh, yen's cheap. I don't try to remember if I've got a position on yen. I'm sure yen, so that that's bad for me. Thanks, Henry. Um, hopefully... Uh, if, if yen does move down, I will change my position, uh, move up, I'll change my position at some point. Brent futures have uh, got a lot of backwardation, which is interesting. So that that supports a long position in those. I don't, I have got, I'm short gas, uh, but I don't have any position there. So that's not helpful either. Uh, I, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, VIX is really cheap. Um, so he actually quantifies it and says it's at the 16th percentile of historical readings. In other words, out of every kind of eight historical periods, it's only ever been cheaper than this one, one in eight of those. So that that's, again, seems kind of cheap. But as you said, Niels, earlier, it might be that the risk we get is an inequities, and that's the reason why. Um, and of course, it's man, so they, they you know, alternatives. Um, traditional risk premium are compressed, so um, you should be looking at alternative risk premium. And although, Niels, you don't agree with the the theoretical idea that, that uh, you know, momentum is a risk premium, um, if you do, then um, I guess uh, you, you might might be of the opinion that even if the outright performance of momentum doesn't look good because everything else looks so shockingly expensive, maybe on a relative basis, uh, you should put a bit more money into trend following this year. So there we go. I've kind of finished with a nice little advert for trend following and I expect my check in the post. I'm sure you uh, will get that from some. Um, yeah, no, of course. I couldn't agree more with the fact that uh, trend following should always be part of the portfolio. Uh, not necessarily, I think, that it uh, is something that you should trade around, um, but you should certainly have a constant high core allocation to uh, the strategy without a doubt. All right, well, um, if um, anyone out there listening today uh, has enjoyed this conversation, which we hope uh, you did, um, then please uh, go and leave us a rating and review on the various uh, podcast platforms. Uh, they really do help. And we do read all of them uh, as they come in. So we would uh, kindly ask you to help us out on that. Uh, also, of course, share the podcast with a friend or family member or uh, a colleague. 
uh, that certainly uh, is also highly appreciate, appreciated. Next week, I'm joined by Katie. Katie is back for a fun, insightful confirmation, as a, not confirmation, conversation <laughs> is what I meant. Um, so if you have questions for Katie, send them in, info at toptradersonblog.com. That's where we will get them and answer them. And um, in the meantime, Rob and I will just like to say a big thanks for listening. We look forward to being back next week. And in the meantime, as usual, um, and by the way, do not forget to listen to Jim and Dave uh, as we publish that on Wednesday. It's a really uh, exceptional conversation. Anyways, in the meantime, until next week, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.